All right, good morning, everyone. It's our pleasure to have you here. On behalf of the Duke, Duke Journal of Comparative International Law, we would like to welcome you to our annual symposium. Today's is on foreign official immunity, and we're so excited to develop the papers that we're going to publish in our symposium issue through some very productive discussion this morning. But before we begin, there are a couple people that it's incumbent upon me to thank. Um, it's cliche, but certainly not untrue that we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for our symposium coordinators, Jeb Dennis and Dominic Lorario. If we could just give them a quick hand, they've done so much work. And I would also like to thank our faculty advisor, Ralph Michaels. Thank you for all of your advice and your help. We appreciate it so much. <laughs> One more round of applause. <laughs> And finally, thank you to all of our speakers for being here today. I know so many of you have traveled a long distance to be here with us this morning, and we're so excited to hear from each and every one of you. And now I'm going to hand the mic over to our managing editor, Vinay Misor, who will introduce our first speaker and discussant. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Again, thank you so much for being here. Our first speaker will be Michaela Frui from the University of Florence. Uh, she will be presenting her paper on the existence of a customary rule granting functional immunity to state officials and its exceptions, back to square one. Uh, she is obviously from Florence and came a long way, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, and researches, her research is in foreign immunity, state immunity, and human rights. Uh, the discussant on her paper will be Mark Weisberg from our sister school in Chapel Hill, the University of North Carolina School of Law, and he teaches civil procedure international law and international human rights law. So thank you so much. So good morning to everybody. And that's my turn to have thanks, <laughs> to say my thank thanks to uh, the Duke Journal of uh, Comparative International Law for this invitation. It's indeed a great honor, uh, and I'm even opening the conference, and a great pleasure to be here today and with such distinguished colleagues. I very much look forward to hear comments, of course, on my um, reflections, but also to hear the presentations by colleagues. So I'll start right away. I know the time is <laughs> running fast. So why I chose this title, back to square one, for the issue of um, you know, uh, reflecting on the existence of a customary rule granting immunity ratione materie to foreign officials before, I mean, the jurisdiction of domestic courts. Well, I was saying this morning, about 15 years ago, when I began studying the topic, I began with this basic assumption in the back of my mind. There exists a general customary rule granting functional immunity, I use functional immunity as a synonym of immunity ratione materie, to all state officials acting on behalf of the state before a domestic courts, before foreign domestic courts. But when uh, I was confronted with the magnitude of documents and elements of state practice and jurisprudence, I said, well, I don't think this is the case. So I, I said, I think I need a step backwards. I need to go back to the basics. So I will try to bring you back with me to square one and to see actually if we can challenge this basic assumption. Um, then, if I have time, I will propose a different way of construing the possibility for domestic courts to exercise jurisdiction over foreign state officials, including those suspected of international crimes. So, what are the basic assumptions um, when talking about functional immunity? Usually, we have two basic assumptions. The first one, it is acknowledged by many states, by most scholars, I would say still, that functional immunity from the jurisdiction of foreign states cover activities performed in, by all state officials in their official capacity in the exercise of the function, and it survives the end of office. Second basic assumption is also widely, widely shared that the rationale uh, behind this rule is the fact that official activities are performed by state organs on behalf of the state, and in principle must be attributed to the state itself, not to the individual. So the ultimate reason behind immunity would be respect for state sovereignty, uh, enshrined in the principle par in parem non abet imperium, as you all know. However, are these assumptions correct? Uh, assumption number one, existence of a general rule, of a general customary rule. I think if we take into consideration, uh, you know, the uh, elements of state practice, mainly domestic law, but not only as Professor Escobar knows very well, it's very hard to find evidence of such a general rule and of its consistent application. 
Um, on the contrary, there are many cases where national courts did exercise the jurisdiction over foreign state officials unless there was a treaty rule granting uh, a functional immunity to a specific class of state officials or unless these officials also enjoy personal or diplomatic immunities. I will try to substantiate my doubts with a very, very brief overview of state practice, and I want to quote the most renowned case, the most quoted ones. First of all, um, of course, the McLeod case. McLeod case is at all times quoted as evidence of the existence of a general rule because of the position expressed by the governments in board. However, and leaving aside the fact that the case dates back to 1841, so it's not properly a recent case, but MacLeod was in fact brought to trial in spite of the fact that the British government was assuming responsibility for his acts and it was eventually acquitted on the grounds of merit. Um, other case most frequently reported, the Rainbow Warrior case. With France, much recent more recent case where France took responsibility for the criminal acts committed by its secret agents, Freire and Maffart, and invoked their immunity from criminal jurisdiction. In that case as well, France found the opposition. In this case, both of the New Zealand government and of uh, domestic courts, and both agents were in fact tried and sentenced to 10 years in criminal proceedings. I stop here, but I could make you know, other cases. There are many like this. The point made by um, scholars is that this kind of cases, and Kolotkin also was first rapporteur was sharing this point of view, is that in fact, here we are um, you know, in the exception, because these are activities that were not covered by authorization by the consent of the forum state, so they fall into an exception to a general rule. Um, but I think it's very hard to reconcile this point of view with the notion of immunity ratione materia conceived in terms of attribution of activities to the state itself, as many people still do. Because if the crucial test is to, des to decide whether functional immunity may be applied, is the fact that conduct must be attributed to the state, and if invocation by the state is the uh, act triggering the application of immunity ratione materia, then why unauthorized activities um, or activities carried out without their consent should not be attributed to the state who is claiming that the organs were acting on its behalf? And in addition, anyway, there are so many cases where you know, there was the exercise of foreign jurisdiction of a state officials for activities that were previously authorized and resting on the consent of the forum state. Now, here I come to a point. Practice is scant for an obvious reason. When state officials reside abroad, normally they are covered by treaty rules. Because if, you know, if they are on consular agents or military forces stationing abroad, there is a treaty covering also the issue of immunity. So actually, if uh, eventually the issue come up, we have a treaty rule giving the answer. We don't need to find for a general rule. So next logical step, very quick, is to say something about um, these treaty rules and the jurisprudence concerning some spe specific categories of state officials in order to verify whether the rules contained in these treaties and applied by domestic courts provide um, immunity ratione matera and under which conditions, and eventually may give also indications on existence of a general customary rule. So first of all, visiting armed forces. A uh, relevant case in point, because usually visiting armed forces are categorized as beneficiaries of immunity ratione materia. The stationing of military uh, troops on foreign territory, both on a permanent and temporary basis, is regulated, as you all know, by means of bilateral or multilateral agreements. And both old and uh, new agreements, the new agreements you, you all know are called the SOFA, the Status of Forces Agreements, contain <coughs> rules on the exercise of criminal jurisdiction. Now, uh, these rules are very diverse, of course. Some of them provide for exclusive criminal jurisdiction of the sentence state. In other cases, most often, they provide for a concurrent jurisdiction between the sending and the off state. But the point I want to make is that it's very clear that these rules are never designed as immunity rules, but they are clearly drafted as rules allocating jurisdictional competence among contracting parties. So, you know, they divide the competence between the sending and the off state, but there is no reference to um, immunity. Another category that deserves special consideration is that of consular agents. In the past, the status of consular agents was regulated again by bilateral agreements. And in the vast majority of these bilateral agreements, one may find a clause 
um, giving immunity reazione materie functional immunity to uh, the consuls for acts performed in the exercise of consular functions. The letter of these old agreements was extremely clear. Uh, the scope of immunity rules is very restrictive. Uh, to benefit from immunity, the consular officer not only must have acted in an official capacity, but also within the limit of its competencies according to international law. The issue now is dealt with by the Article 43 of the Consular Convention of 1963, which speaks of acts performed in the exercise of consular functions. There is no generic mention of official activities or official functions, and I think it's very important because actually this option was discarded if you look at the preparatory work. So they were really mm, meaning only regular exercise of consular functions. Indeed, domestic law confirms a restrictive application of immunity ratione materia to consular agents. Both old and recent case law confirm that the judges recognize immunity only for those contested acts that they consider falling within regular exercise of consular functions. Uh, so the idea is that only acts that are actually enlisted, functions are enlisted in the Vienna Convention, only acts falling within the uh, functions enlisted in the Convention can be covered by immunity. For acts not enlisted, interest states may reach an agreement, but eventually domestic judge, judges will make the final decision at their own discretion and they will decide on the application of the rule. A similar conclusion may be reached with respect to, to the scope of functional immunity of high-ranking state officials. And you have to trust me because I have no time to summarize <laughs> relevant practice, but I can come back on this if you wish, of course. Um, in sum, if a careful analysis of state practice and jurisprudence is the crucial test, then such an analysis seems to show that instead of taking the existence of a general rule as a basic assumption, it's possible to conclude the other way around, that the general rule is the possibility for domestic courts to exercise criminal jurisdiction over foreign state officials unless otherwise specified by a treaty rule, and that the scope of functional immunity depend on the respective scope of such rules. Um, a great step forward lies, I believe, in the finding that the definition of state official for the purpose of invoking immunity, ratione materia, does not coincide with the broad definition of state organ given by the ILC in the 2001 Articles on State Responsibility. And the actual rapporteur is going in that direction, and I think other scholars here today, I know they share this point of view. I think this is a crucial point. The category of state officials who fulfill the criteria for benefiting from functional immunity is indeed smaller than that of individuals whose official or governmental acts may be attributed to the states on which behalf they acted. In other words, not every time that the conduct of an individual may be attributed to the state and engages responsibility, the individual who performed it may benefit from immunity ratione materia from foreign jurisdiction. Uh, I have just tried to show that the issue of functional immunity may not be solved in terms of attribution and domestic courts do not turn to the attribution rules when making a decision on functional immunity. They evaluate the circumstances on a case-by-case -case basis, relying on the existence of a treaty rule, and in any case, taking into account the nature of activities performed. So this brings me to challenge the second assumption as well. What is the rationale of immunity ratione materia? Regarding the rationale of functional immunity, the prevailing view, as I said before, is in, uh, that it lies in the par in par in principle, respect for state sovereignty. On the contrary, I would like to argue that there may be another and most significant raison d'etre underlying the immunity ratione materia rules in case where they do exist, and that the different rationale also reinforces the conclusion that there is no general rule. On, function, uh, on functional immunity covering all state officials. From a logical point of view, uh, if we assume that we are dealing with functional immunity, uh, when, we, when dealing with functional immunity we are protecting state sovereignty, temptation to move back to the first basic assumption is very strong. If immunity ratione materia protects the sovereignty of states, indeed it seems that the only factor to be taken into account should be the fact that the state assumes responsibility for the action of his officials invoking functional immunity, and we are both brought back to the attribution rules. But as you have seen, this conclusion is not supported by state practice and jurisprudence. 
However, there is also another, and in my opinion, more important factor raising doubts on the possibility to frame functional immunity in terms of attribution and foster reflection on the rationale usually linked with it. If we take a close look at the treaty rules providing for functional immunity for specific categories of state officials, the underlying principle of these rules seem to have to do much more with a functional necessity idea than with the sovereignty of states. The example of consular agents, again, is a fitting one. The rationale underlying the immunity rule inserted in the consular convention does not seem to be protection of the sovereignty of the sending state, irrespective of whatever act may be accomplished by its consuls in their official capacity, but the efficient performance of consular functions. The ne impediator officium rationale normally attached to personal immunities. Vast jurisprudence supports a strictly function related rationale for the immunity rules of the consular convention. And the same functions related rationale may be found, I think, in the 1961 Convention on Diplomatic Relations, although, of course, diplomats also enjoy personal immunity that cover their private acts while they are in office. In addition, there is another trend that may be identified in case law on this matter, and I think goes in the same direction. There is a number of judgments where immunity that was conferred on to state officials on a treaty basis was not upheld because they acted ultra vires, to say, that is to say outside the scope of the functions covered by the treaty rule. In other words, there seems to be a tendency to, by domestic courts to increasingly apply a strictly functions-related rationale to the interpretation of immunity ratione materia rules. And both of these trends, I think, are recognized by the recent reports drafted by Professor Escobar. Uh, however, it seems to me that they did not lead her to uh, <laughs> draw radical conclusions about the raison d'etre of immunity ratione materia. And in my, of course, very modest opinion, um, I think you know, this, this needs a reflection. The fact that the immunity ratione materia are applied in a very restrictive matter, manner shows that they have been interpreted as rules protecting the activities by state officials and not actually the sovereignty of the state. I mean, not mainly, of course. Sovereignty is always there. Um, very quickly, can we talk about an exception for international crimes? If we agree with the above proposed line of reasoning, then it would be easier to conclude, of course, that it is indeed possible to prosecute state official in national courts, um, and more specifically, of course, for international crimes. There is no need to find an exception to a general rule. It suffices to correctly interpret and apply existing rules in order to prosecute state officials suspected of having committed international crimes. Because, as I said, in many cases, there is no rule on immunity, so in these cases, of course, crimes may be prosecuted. And in cases where there is a treaty rule, it does not seem that the rule can cover international crimes. The main function of these rules seem to be the safeguard of the smooth functioning of you know, interstate relations, so the performance of specific functions. And such a performance obviously do not include and may not include the commission of international crime, which are inherently ultra vires acts. The unavailability of functional immunity before domestic courts for those accused of international crimes would not be, in this perspective, an exception to the rule, but it would be an expression of its correct application. The argument equating crimes with ultra vires act, I think, has many times um, been misunderstood. So a few words here. Saying that uh, grave crimes are ultra vires acts does not mean that they are non-official or non-sovereign acts. They may well be committed under the color of authority, precisely abusing of one's official role. It simply means that they cannot be included in functions legally entrusted to state officials and in some cases covered by functional immunity rules. It also means, incidentally, that in any case the state may not be absolved from its responsibility because there are criminal proceedings against its officials. More in general, when dealing with immunity of state officials and international crimes, I think it's particularly misleading to frame the issue as a matter of exception. Once again, also for logical reasons. In the case of international crimes, the dual attribution of conduct to the state and to the individual is regulated by international rules, so that both kinds of responsibility arise at the international level. The emerging of individual criminal responsibility on the international plane renders possible a dual attribution at that level and on that account, national courts may, and sometimes are obliged to, 
prosecute those suspected of international crimes irrespective of their official position. International criminal responsibility for certain grave acts may be adjudicated since early days at the national level and rules establishing it would be, I think, meaningless if any kind of rule on functional immunity could hamper the application. Needless to say, most serious crimes are very seldom committed by private persons. National courts are indeed, I would call them the natural judge for these cases and often the only viable option not surprisingly, the cornerstone of the International Criminal Court system is complementarity, and its best chance to be an efficient tribunal actually lies on the will of states to prosecute at the national level. A uh, few concluding thoughts, very brief, on um, what uh, we could say about immunity in civil proceedings. Of course, I have been focusing, as uh, the rapporteur as well, is focusing on immunity from criminal jurisdiction. But I think the same conclusions could be reached for immunity in civil proceedings, and here I disagree with the conclusions reached by most scholars, and you know, uh, most scholars say that immunity always applies in civil proceedings, and we have been, uh, you know, we have seen judges actually upholding immunity in civil proceedings. We all know the cases before the UK courts. But to my mind, I think, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe because I come from a civil law background. Uh, you know, in my country, we have the Constitution de Partie Civile, the adhesion process. So it's very artificial to think of two separate solutions for the question of immunity, depending on whether the complaint against the officials filed before a civil or a criminal court. In, in common law countries, of course, you have separate uh, proceedings. Uh, so I may be biased, but I think a different solution for civil and criminal proceedings is inconsistent and it brings us back to the question of attribution as the pivotal one around which the question of the functional immunity must be sought. If we abandon the idea that functional immunity is a substantive obstacle to the exercise of jurisdiction, then why should it be upheld before a civil court? as it regards international crimes, if they may be, you know, if they may not be covered by, you know, functional immunity in a criminal trial, why the same acts would fall under the breach of functional immunity in a civil process? And I'm just concluding with a paradox, because I have finished my time. Um, it has often been said, uh, and always recalled, concerning the criminal liability of individuals for the most serious crimes, that state officials may not hide behind the states. They may not claim to have been just a cog in the machine or to have obeyed to instructions given by others. But if one follows the House of Lords, let's say, line of reasoning in Jones, for instance, and keeps separate, totally separate, the question of functional immunity for crimes in civil proceedings, one arrives at the conclusion that actually the states are now, are now hiding behind the organs because only the latter, at the end of the day, may be prosecuted before a domestic criminal court or when available before an international criminal tribunal. Thanks a lot for your attention. <clears throat> Professor Frilly, uh, thank you very much for producing a most interesting paper. Um, I'm far from being an expert on this subject. Uh, I hesitate to comment uh, too much on it for that reason, but I, there are a couple of points I think I'm able to make. Uh, most fundamentally, I agree with your conclusion that the divergent results uh, with respect to the applicability of a customary law rule of official immunity uh, in domestic situations uh, precludes the existence of any such rule. Uh, I'm a strict positivist, and if one is a strict po pro positivist, pardon me, one can't find a rule without a general practice of states. If there is no general practice of states, there is no rule, QED. Uh, I would also add that you are surely correct uh, that it is uh, not terribly helpful 
to attempt to establish the existence of a rule of customary law by pointing to practice under treaties. Uh, that by no means is any kind of a reliable indicator of what would happen if there were no treaty. Uh, those, I take it, are, are two of your fundamental points, and we're in agreement there. Uh, having said that, uh, there are a couple of observations I think I can make. Um, one, I guess, is simply the great difficulty of finding practice of any sort in this area. That is to say, one has to ask oneself, under what circumstances would the question of a customary law rule uh, based on functional immunity become relevant? Well, in the first place, uh, except for consuls, the only occasion on which we would be considering purely a functional rule uh, would be after the official has left office. Uh, furthermore, there would have to be a prosecution by some state other than that official's home state. And finally, the official must be within the territory of some state, either the prosecuting state or an extraditing state, that would be willing to apprehend the official. If he's not apprehended, he's not going to be tried. Uh, that reduces the occasions for, for uh, thinking about this subject uh, to a very great extent. A second point, uh, and uh, Professor Escobar has made this point in her most recent report, but I think it uh, is important to keep in mind, it cannot be right to say that the availability of functional immunity depends on the uh, compliance with the domestic law of the state that wants to prosecute. Uh, if that were the case, there can never be immunity. You don't prosecute people for obeying the law. Uh, necessarily, the question arises only if there is some suggestion that domestic law has been breached. So that distinction, I think, uh, is an important one. With those two general comments, uh, to the extent that the question is, does immunity arise simply because an action can be attributed to a state, surely uh, that can't be true. Uh, the, when one thinks about the vast range of actions that can be attributed to a state not performed by anyone with any conceivable uh, claim to be an official, surely that wouldn't be enough. Uh, but if attribution is not a sufficient condition, it still may be a necessary condition. Uh, that is, attribution plus something about uh, the status of the person whose action is in question. Um, the issue of whether immunity exists uh, for the protection of the state's sovereignty is also one on which I think we disagree. Um, ask oneself, I guess, when we talk about functional immunity uh, for an official, uh, what do we mean by functions? Well, presumably, we mean things that the official is doing, ostensibly, at least, uh, in pursuit of his duties. Well, to whom are the duties owed? The state. Uh, why is he engaging in the activity? He's engaging in the activity uh, not just because he is an official of the state, but solely 
because he's an official of the state. In effect, the functional activities are simply uh, using the official as a mechanism whereby the state can accomplish uh, a particular objective of its own. Uh, in that sense, uh, it would seem that if one talks about functional immunity, one is more or less conceding that uh, the official is exercising some fragment uh, of a state sovereignty. Um, now, my final point uh, goes to the question of an exception to the rule for international crimes. Uh, of course, if there is no rule, there's no need for an exception. So in that sense, I suppose, I need not address this. Uh, but I will anyway. Uh, uh, remember, part of the reason for immunity rules, even I suggest functional, uh, functionally based immunity rules, is to protect officials, even former officials, from bad faith prosecutions. And of course, if the issue is a bad faith prosecution, uh, the fact that the prosecution is based on an international crime uh, or a domestic crime uh, really doesn't alter the problem. Uh, the second point uh, I would make on this is that uh, one has to consider who is affected by the denial of functional immunity uh, with respect to the uh, prosecution of an international crime. Uh, on this point, I suspect uh, my views might differ slightly from uh, some, those of some other people. Uh, I am one of those who thinks that uh, it's less important to prosecute perpetrators of international crimes than to halt the perpetration of international crimes. If that means one has to guarantee amnesty to perpetrators to stop the killing, then guarantee amnesty to the perpetrators. It's more important to keep people getting, uh, from being killed uh, than for punishing somebody for acts that in any event cannot be undone. Uh, if, therefore, a state other than that, which for whatever domestic reasons granted some sort of an amnesty to the official, chooses to, in effect, uh, ignore that amnesty, the question of uh, who actually will pay the price for that is important. Now, of course, I do not mean to say that such prosecutions inevitably are going to destroy some sort of a settlement. Uh, the Pinochet case, I think, is a good example of both points. When the question of Pinochet's extradition arose, there were tremendous fears that extraditing him uh, would lead to great disorder in Chile. In the event, the opposite happened. In fact, it was the occasion for a reversal of Chilean domestic politics. My point simply is that either way, the price is not paid by the prosecuting state. It's paid by the state where the crimes were committed. And that then raises the question, once again, of what state ought to be in a position to, in effect, uh, upset that arrangement. Well, uh, I think I've gone about as far as my limited knowledge permits, so thank you very much. Thank you both so much again. again.
Does that make sense, Dom? Oh, we need the PowerPoint. to be so dark. Should be working, they said this clicker. Annoying. The mouse the mouse works. I just want the clicker to Maybe that's it. Will it work if it's up here? Yeah, it might just be low, you're right. The mouse works, yeah. We'll go see if they have another clicker somewhere. What's wrong with this one? It's not working. Okay, so they have the mouse right now. This works, huh? If we can just have them use the mouse to click. Yeah, the mouse button. and then you have yeah, the... Yeah, I don't think you need to worry about how this is there. So just introduce name, little bio, then with, then their paper, and yeah. then... So at 9.50, system. you should like clerk and everyone to sit down. It's on the arm, but I'm not sure. <laughs> that is a uh, very, very likely, actually. <laughs> We've had them stolen. I don't know why. So that just the 
cool. Hello, everyone. Hi, thank you. Um, first off, I'd like to thank everyone um, for being here. That was a great uh, first paper by Professor Fruley, and we really appreciate her uh, insight. Um, next up, we have Ms. Martina Vandenberg. We are very excited to have her. She has spent nearly two decades fighting um, human trafficking, forced labor, rape as a war crime, and violence against women. Uh, Ms. Vandenberg has represented victims of human trafficking, pro bono, and immigration, criminal and civil cases. Widely regarded as an expert in an array of litigation and human rights issues, she has testified before the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Human Rights and the Law and the Helsinki Commission, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and the House Armed Services Committee. Her paper is Diplomatic Immunity and Human Trafficking, a Long March to Justice. Also commenting is Professor Sarah Adamczyk. Before joining Duke Law in 2015, Professor Adamczyk worked with the Norwegian Refugee Council for four years, running legal and humanitarian programs in the Gaza Strip, Jordan, Ukraine, which included the coordination of legal assistance to displaced populations, as well as research, advocacy, and strategic uh, litigation. She has experience managing projects at U.S. legal clinics, supervising students in field work, and a track record of partnerships with local and international human rights organizations, including UN agencies. So please help me welcome, um, first, Ms. Martina Vandenberg, and second, Professor Sarah Adamczyk. That's the laser pointer, and it's back. Okay, perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. It's a tremendous honor to be here, and particularly an honor to speak at Duke Law School because I am not an academic. I am, as you heard from my bio, completely a practitioner. So I don't study these issues. I actually litigate these issues in court and train other lawyers, particularly in Washington, D.C. and New York, to litigate these issues. And so what I want to talk to you, to, what I want to talk to you about today is actually the collision between the beautiful law of which you spoke, and the realities of both litigating and then running into troublesome political considerations on the ground. So I'd like to start, actually, with a case that is, as we say, ripped from the headlines. Um, how many of you know about the Cobragati case? Yes. There was a period during December of 2013, if you turned on CNN, you could not avoid learning about the Cobra Gotti case because it was on infinite loop. The same pictures of the Deputy General Counsel from the Consulate of India in New York run over and over and over again. Again, I make that distinction about her position very consciously because she was a consular official covered by the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. If you remember the story, she was dropping her children off at school. She was arrested by the Diplomatic Security Service in front of the school after her children had already gone into the school. She was then taken to uh, the Marshal Service. The Marshals handed her over to the local authorities and an arrest of a consular official turned into a major diplomatic incident because of allegations of a strip search. 
this case catapulted issues of diplomatic immunity, issues that are normally relegated to law school classrooms, catapulted these issues onto the front pages of the New York Times, onto the constant loop of CNN, but also on the front pages of the Indian press. The allegations against Cobra Gotti were actually quite serious, and they are part and parcel of the kinds of cases that we see not just in Washington, D.C., not just in New York, but in capitals around the globe where diplomats are permitted to bring domestic workers with them to their posting and have those domestic workers work in their homes. In the United States, those domestic workers come on special visas. The categories are A3 and G5. Generally, domestic workers who come with full diplomats with full protection under the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, generally those domestic workers come with A3 visas. What's interesting here is that Cobra Gotti had done something that most diplomats, frankly, are too bright to do. Um, she had issued two contracts in writing. For a federal prosecutor, this was a slam dunk. For a federal prosecutor, it was like shooting fish in a barrel because one contract for the domestic worker was issued to get the visa. The second contract, which the domestic worker signed, written by Cobra Gotti, was the real contract. Most of these agreements are oral, so it makes it much more difficult to prove. But in the second contract, which violated US law for A3 visas, in the second contract, basically there was no limit on the number of hours that the domestic worker was required to work. Preet Bharara, who's the Southern District of New York US attorney, issued a criminal inf information in this case, and the allegations were visa fraud lying to a federal official. In the criminal investigation, they had uncovered that this particular domestic worker who had run away, as so many do, that this particular domestic worker had had her passport seized, that she had earned only about $1.42 an hour by the time you balanced out all the time that she was working. When she ran away, Cobra Gotti and her family responded by filing criminal charges against the victim in India. Her family, the victim's family, facing harassment in India, was then brought to the United States at US government expense by the Diplomatic Security Service. This only inflamed the major outrage on the part of the Indian government. And again, this diplomatic incident escalated into the Indian government pulling all of the security barriers away from the US Embassy in India, escalated into the Indian government threatening to close down the American school. It turned into the Indian government threatening to stop the US government from, I kid you not, showing movies in the American, <laughs> in the American uh, Citizen Center. So this very simple, frankly, very straightforward from my perspective as a lawyer representing victims of human trafficking in the United States. And by the way, the State Department in its own trafficking in persons report that was issued the following year characterized this case as a human trafficking case. This very simple case, which was then indicted under the charges that were on the previous slide as the allegations, became an enormous fight that illustrates the contrast between diplomatic and consular immunity. Because at the start, the arrest was purely permissible under the US government's interpretation of the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. In fact, in the United States, consular officials have been arrested in the past, there was really nothing shocking about this. What was shocking was the Indian government's reaction and attempt to create ex post facto blanket immunity for this particular diplomat by trying to cloak her in a, a, a title that they then gave to her ex post facto, claiming that she was actually a member of the Indian mission to the United Nations, and then therefore protected by the same privileges and immunities that would be provided for mission members, 
a much broader kind of 24-7 full wraparound immunity that she sought in order to avoid these charges in the United States. So just to give you the sort of chronology that's fascinating because I think it really does in a very real life way illustrate consular versus diplomatic immunity and the interplay between the two. The criminal inf information comes down, she's arrested. Pressure on the US government is immense and Secretary Kerry, much to our dismay and chagrin, agrees that this transfer to the UN Indian, to the Indian mission to the United Nations, agrees that this transfer can go through. The Indian government is then asked for a waiver of immunity. The Indian government says no, as most do. The United States never waives immunity, most countries do not. But interestingly enough, Cobra Gotti then, cloaked in her full diplomatic immunity as a member of the Indian mission to the United Nations, agrees to leave. Preet Bharara issues the indictment, files the indictment. The indictment hits before Cobra Gotti leaves because she doesn't leave when she says she's going to. And so Judge Scheindlin dismisses the indictment on grounds of diplomatic immunity. Ironically, this dismissal happened at the time that all of the protocol officers for the, for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe were meeting in The Hague to discuss trafficking by diplomats. And so this was the development that occurred as these protocol officers were debating and, and discussing best practices for dealing with domestic workers trafficked by diplomats, which as I said, is as much a problem in Brussels as it is in Washington, D.C. Cobra Gotti finally left. Tremendous pressure was put on the Department of Justice, frankly, by the advocacy community to reissue the indictment. The, issue, the, the indictment was refiled, exactly the same indictment, but now because Cobra Gotti was gone and no longer enjoyed immunity and no longer enjoyed residual immunity, which I'll discuss in a moment, for these particular alleged crimes, when the indictment was refiled, it remained in place, not dismissed. So Cobra Gotti is now the equivalent of an international fugitive. She cannot come back to the United States. She would have to face these charges. Nor is she probably going to go to any other country where the United States would ask for extradition. While for many of the academics in the room, the Bible and the treatise is Denza or, or some other, for law enforcement officials on the ground who are handling these cases, the, the Bible it actually comes from the Office of Foreign Missions. And this is, an act, this is a very useful document, I think, particularly for students to look at because it has pictures of the various license plates, it has pictures of the various driver's licenses. In order to educate law enforcement officials, judges and prosecutors in the United States about what to do when someone comes forward and claims diplomatic immunity, which frankly people do very frequently. And so we've had a number of cases now with Saudi princesses and others who when the police approach, also ironically in domestic servitude and trafficking cases in some circumstances, when law enforcement approaches, the Saudi princess says, oh no, I'm covered by diplomatic immunity, which causes particularly local law enforcement officials to recoil in horror and terror for fear that they might offend the State Department and get their hands slapped. But diplomatic and consular immunity, again, the two treaties that I deal with as a matter of practice are the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations and the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. And ironically, those two treaties have an enormous impact on whom we can sue and whom we can sue later, whom we must wait to sue. My job is all about patience. But before I get to lawsuits, let me talk about criminal cases because there have actually been criminal cases brought in the United States on trafficking grounds, on exploitation grounds in our federal courts. So here's the Cobra Gotti case, which we've already talked about. Another amazing case currently pending is a colonel from Qatar who was indicted in the Western District of Texas after a domestic worker fled his house 
and was found walking around a US military base, was picked up by military police, and this case was actually, the Hamoud case was actually indicted as forced labor. Two women in the house, the allegations were that these women were held in a form of domestic servitude and trafficked into forced labor. That case is still pending at the moment. Um, although if you want some interesting reading, the, the hearing from the actual plea agreement hearing is, is, is worth a read. Um, but, but again, other cases, the Penzato case, the Italian consul in California alleged to have exploited, mistreated a domestic worker. This case also includes allegations of, of sexual assault, and, and, uh, which we unfortunately in the domestic servitude cases see quite frequently. Uh, that case pled out, but again, there was restitution ordered. Restitution essentially means an admission that there were back wages that were owed as part of the plea deal. The Tolan case is a particularly troubling case. This was an Egyptian national who actually worked for the, uh, for the UAE embassy. He had an A3 domestic worker, so one of the domestic workers assigned to diplomats. But in this case, the defendants departed the jurisdiction. What's interesting about these cases is all of these individuals, with the exception of Soberon, all of these individuals only had limited functional immunity. The difference is Soberon. He was the ambassador of Mauritius to the United Nations, and his country waived his immunity. We believe at his own request. Again, the logistics of this, for those who had to learn this the hard way, as I did, I had to learn this through practice rather than through study. Um, what happens as a general matter is if the Department of Justice or another law enforcement agency or prosecutor determines that they would prosecute this case but for diplomatic immunity, then they speak to the Department of State and in theory, at least, the Department of State has no alternative but to go to the sending state of the diplomat and request a waiver. Again, as I said before, the waivers are almost never accepted, almost never granted. But in the Soberon case, the victim from the Philippines, the defendant from Mauritius, he pled guilty to essentially wage theft. And the restitution ordered was $24,000. Again. When there's restitution, it is generally an indication that fair wages were not paid because restitution is designed to make these particular victims whole. But as you can see, I'm not a federal prosecutor. I'm a civil litigator. And I'm a civil litigator who's a human rights lawyer who fell into questions of diplomatic immunity by virtue of the fact that the defendants I was asked by my clients to pursue and to sue in federal court happened to be diplomats and people protected by some sort of functional immunity in other cases, some World Bank employees and others. <coughs> Trafficking victims in the United States can bring federal cases. What's interesting about this is uh, the Human Trafficking Pro Bono Legal Center, the organization where I work, uh, we track every federal case in the United States. We have a database both of every criminal case brought on grounds of trafficking since January 1st, 2009, and every single civil case brought in the United States. What's interesting about the civil cases, if you look at them closely, is that of 154 total cases brought by plaintiffs in the United States, which is no easy thing to do for a trafficking victim to find a lawyer and bring a case, of those 154 total cases, 25 of them were brought by domestic workers against either diplomats or against those with other, other forms of functional immunity either consular immunity or immunity uh, by, dirt, by, by virtue of the fact that they work at an international organization like the United Nations, the World Bank, or the IMF. So just to take a step back in time to go back to square one, as you said, we as litigators beat our heads against a wall because of a lack of legal creativity. We were stuck in an analysis of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, which was unsuccessful, but we frankly could not see a way around it. Um, the Tabion case is a landmark case, and I don't mean that in a positive way from the perspective of a litigator. The Tabion case involved the first secretary of the Jordanian embassy, 
Tabion, who was his domestic worker, had filed a lawsuit alleging false imprisonment. She had alleged that she was threatened with deportation if she ran away. She threatened that she was paid 50 cents, an, uh, she, she alleged that she was paid 50 cents an hour, forced to work 16 hours a day, given no days off, not allowed to leave the house. The Jordanian first secretary and his wife did what diplomats do, frankly. They filed a motion to quash service and a motion to dismiss the entire case. Unfortunately for this particular individual uh, in the Eastern District of Virginia, um, the courts agreed and read the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations as forcing the court, with regret, to dismiss the case. Now, what was the analysis? The analysis was Tabion's lawyers had argued that this particular criminal activity, that this particular activity of trafficking or exploiting a domestic worker fell into one of the exceptions. So here, a diplomatic agency uh, agent has total immunity, as has been said, from criminal jurisdiction of the receiving state, but there are exceptions to civil jurisdiction exclusion. And so, the lawyers had basically argued that based on Article 31 c they had argued that having a domestic worker was commercial activity and that this particular diplomat was engaged in commercial activity, an exception to the Vienna Convention, and therefore this case should be adjudicated as a commercial activity exception case. Both the Eastern District of Virginia and the Fourth Circuit, which took a hard look at this case, both determined that the sort of penumbra of Article 31 and also Article 42 of the Vienna Convention, which states, a diplomatic agent shall not in the receiving state practice for personal profit any professional or commercial activity. Combining Article 31 and Article 42, both the Eastern District of Virginia and the Fourth Circuit made a determination that having a domestic worker was not commercial activity. It was not for profit. And in words that I think are slightly ill-chosen, the court said that the day-to-day -day activities incidental to daily life of, of uh, a diplomat or a consular officer, such as dry cleaning or domestic help, dry cleaning or domestic help, are not commercial activities. We tried, as litigators, in multiple cases to, to maneuver our way around the reasoning, the dry cleaning and domestic help reasoning of the Fourth Circuit and the exclusion uh, of, this, of these cases from the commercial activity exception. And we failed, and we failed, and we failed until happily the State Department came along and told us what we were doing wrong. Uh, the State Department intervened in two cases. One was the Boanan case, which was a civil case brought against the Philippine ambassador to the United Nations. But the more important case that went to the Second Circuit was SWARNA. And the SWARNA case was enormously important because the State Department's intervention, and this intervention was done by two brilliant lawyers at, uh, at, in L. Um, Susan Benda, who does diplomatic law in L, and Harold Coe, who happened to be uh, the, the um, L at that stage. The brief for SWARNA essentially argues that while diplomats enjoy full wraparound immunity in situ while they are at post, when they leave, their immunity shrinks to just residual immunity, the residual immunity that they bring with them when they go home or when they go to their next post, ceases at the moment he leaves the country, or she, as the case of Cobragati illustrates. Cobragati was indicted because it ceased at the moment she left the country, or on expiry of a reasonable period. Um, Okay, however, with respect to acts performed by such, such a person in exercise of his functions as a member of the mission, immunity shall continue to subsist. So we could not possibly sue Cobra Gatti for something that she did as part of her newfangled functions um, at the UN in the Indian mission. It's a slightly different treaty, but it's the same, it's the same idea. But now when I 
meet with defense attorneys who are defending diplomats, and when they walk into my office and they say, uh, we're not covered by this law, we have total immunity, we're filing a motion to quash and dismiss tomorrow, what I say to them is, I've made a binder for you. Here is the binder. It has the Swarna case, it has the US government inter intervention, it has the Boadan case. I shove the binder across the table and I say to them, you know, number one, I'm working pro bono. Number two, I am like a bad smell and I do not go away. Because at some point, your diplomat will leave. And when your diplomat leaves, dismiss our case. We have good case law in a footnote, but good case law, that the statute of limitations is told while your diplomat enjoys full immunity under the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. But when your diplomat leaves, the holding in Swarna by the Second Circuit establishes that your diplomat's immunity shrinks to only official functions. And every court that has opined on this has said that raping your domestic worker, sexually abusing your domestic worker, holding your domestic worker in forced labor, threatening her with deportation, falsely imprisoning her, taking her passport. None of those things are part of a diplomat's official functions. And so it does change the defense attorney's attitude slightly after they read these particular cases. All right, let me just talk about though how this often works in real life. Real life is a case called um, Mazengo versus Mazengi. In real life, many of the diplomats simply default. They seem to be under the mistaken impression that their claim to the status of diplomat automatically means that a court sua sponte will dismiss a case. And so they do not obtain the, the necessary documentation and paperwork from the Department of State to prove up their immunity so that the case will be dismissed. And so some of these cases actually end in default judgments. Um, the Mazengo case was a case where a woman was held for four years, uh, paid nothing, held in the house, not permitted to leave. Uh, in addition to doing all of the domestic work in the household, she was also cooking for the illegal catering company that the family was running out of their home. So we actually did have a good commercial activity exception argument in this case. I think we could have actually gone up to the DC Circuit with a commercial activity argument for this particular matter because this diplomat, his spouse, was engaging in commercial activity literally for profit, which is so much harder to prove in some other cases. But here, the diplomat decided not to fight and came in only at the last minute hiring a not very well prepared attorney um, to try and undo the judgment after the judgment had been rendered. But what happens in real life is that you end up frequently with a judgment almost impossible to enforce. Because Mr. Mazengi, according to an article written in Time Magazine about this case, Mr. Mazengi apparently went back to Tanzania after the judgment had been entered and was, according to Time Magazine, promoted to work directly with President Kikwete. And so while diplomatic immunity to some extent is premised on this idea that diplomats will be prosecuted at home, not every state has the extraterritorial jurisdiction to actually make that prosecution, although we've now amended US law, so we can. I've spent the last 10 years amending US law to make those prosecutions possible. But there's almost never the requisite political will to prosecute diplomats when they come home. It rarely, rarely happens in cases like this. So what happens, again, in real life? when you end up with a judgment against a diplomat who hasn't asserted immunity through incompetent legal representation, but you have a default judgment, what happens? You use all the skills that you learned at Human Rights Watch, right? Sometimes being a lawyer is not about being in the courtroom. Sometimes it's about being in the advocacy community and in the world and in the policy circles. And so we had a full court press and advocacy campaign. Again, these are the sort of extrajudicial 
efforts to combat diplomatic immunity. Again, none of us as litigators call for the eradication, the, the elimination of diplomatic immunity. That it would be insane. What we are actually calling for are alternative, much more creative ways to find remedies for people who otherwise have none. So we decided to uh, embarrass the American government because the American government was not doing enough to help enforce the judgment from our perspective. So we uh, requested a hearing before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which was granted. And Zipporah Mazengo, I have to say, a remarkable and incredibly brave woman, who was the plaintiff in this case, testified before the Inter-American Commission. And on our side of the table, there were four people. On the American side of the room, I think there must have been 30 um, who had been brought to this hearing to respond to about, about US, uh, US policy on human trafficking, particularly as it relates to diplomats. But what actually made a difference in the end was what actually made a difference in the end was that President Obama decided to go to Tanzania. And so we essentially did everything we could to make that trip as unpleasant as possible. Um, and everyone was working on press coverage and everything broke, frankly, when Dana Milbank of the Washington Post wrote an article um, for his column saying that President Obama should not go to Tanzania because it would be supporting slavery. And at that moment, the dam broke after years of advocacy on the Hill and with the White House and elsewhere. And there was an ex gratia payment made. And so as an advocate for trafficking victims exploited by diplomats, our strategy now is to try and force governments to make payments to provide a remedy for victims who have been so badly harmed by diplomats of that sending state. Um, I can only say that Tanzania is not the only country that has made an ex gratia payment in similar circumstances. So again, ripped from the headlines, and I will stop um, uh, with this. This has been a long march in the United States, a long march to figure out the legal strategies to not circumvent diplomatic immunity, but accommodate our legal work to realize the limitations that diplomatic immunity puts on us. But other countries, unfortunately, around the world have not yet marched that path. And so this case of the Saudi diplomat in, in India is quite remarkable, because as far as I can tell, following this case in the Indian and the US press, as far as I can tell, there has not only been no indictment, there has been no civil case. And with neither of those, for these particular victims, alleged victims, um, there will be no justice. Thank you. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation. Um, I have just a couple comments and, frankly, more questions than anything. Um, you started out by saying this was a collision of law. And for me, too, it's, it's also, I think, a conceptual disconnect, particularly when we're looking at diplomats, those working with international organizations and UN bodies, and working with organizations that have mandates for protection, for human rights, and at the same time, this is, you know, this is happening. And I'll just say from my own personal experience, the extent of abuse of domestic workers by, by diplomats, by those working in international organizations, once I started working with these, with these organizations, was really shocking to me. Um, and just the prevalence, I mean, even that, the fact that the US mission to the UN has had to give trainings and presentations about what are US labor laws, what are fair practices, that this is, this is you know, so for me, there's this huge conceptual disconnect. Um, I think also, too, and I think you touched on it, is this power dynamic, too, this huge power dynamic, not just from a diplomat to someone, you know, to the domestic worker, but as you said, the way we talk about domestic work. From the, the Tabian decision, where we don't look at domestic work as, as a commercial workplace or as a workplace at all, and that domestic work is hidden from view. Um, I, think, I think, and also in these cases, where the visa, where the, your very reason you're in this country is tied to your abuser. I think that's a huge, um, huge issue that I'd be interested to talk more to about the suspension of, of visas. Um, and 
Yeah, I mean, I guess also I'm interested in this immunity, this, the, the fact that this, the Mauritius case was, an was kind of the exception to the rule, that states have the power, the states are the ones who hold the immunity, they have the power in these cases to waive it. Why is it so rare that the State Department requests it? And why is it so rare that states agree to this waiver? Even too, I mean, as the Tanzania example, there is, there is always the possibility of prosecution at home. Um, why is that not explored more? You know, the, your immunity is not going to apply to a domestic prosecution. Um, and here too, I think I go back more, less to the legal side and more, as you mentioned, to the human rights advocacy. What are our sources in, you know, in human rights advocacy? Um, I'd also like to think, I mean, in some of these cases, and I'm thinking particularly from my work experience in Jordan, there's often a third state at play. Um, you had that chart that showed um, the, net, the country of origin of the perpetrators or the accused and the country of origin of the victims. And in the Cobra Gatti case, they were both Indian nationals, I believe. But in many cases, as you're, it showed, it's, it's Filipino nationals, it's uh, Indonesia, Malaysia. There's key countries that, that frankly, in many ways, the, the economies are dependent on these remissions. Um, the money being sent back. I remember working with a couple victims. Um, they were Filipino working in Jordan um, with, on, I don't know if it was a similar type of visa, but they approached the Filipino embassy for assistance and were basically turned away. Um, that these, so I don't know if there's been any attempt for advocacy with, with these countries that these are your nationals, these are your citizens that are being subject to abuse and essentially modern day slavery. Um, you didn't touch on it as much, but I'd like to also to know a bit about kind of your thoughts on the 2008, the Trafficking uh, Victims Protection Reauthorization Act. Um, I think there are a lot of positive things that came out from that, um, particularly this power that the, uh, if there's a credible belief that there's abuse, that the State Department can suspend the A3 and the G5 visas. Um, and if you could speak a bit about whether whether that has been pursued with India, with any other country, um, whether that is, you know, whether there is any precedent there, um, or even, frankly, to make those visas contingent on an agreement that the that um, that the diplomatic immunity will be waived in a, in a situation of trafficking. Um, another key kind of protection under that, not just requiring that there's a written contract, doing rights awareness with vic um, with domestic workers but also protection against deportation, which is key. Um, that your visa no longer needs to be tied to your abuser. Um, that, that, you, that if you are in good faith pursuing a civil claim, you can stay in the country. Um, but my general sense, and again, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, is that the 2008 TVPA did more to prevent than actually kind of allow, creating more avenues for accountability. Um, and that also it seems to have opened up many more possibilities in terms of civil um, accountability and civil litigation, but the criminal avenues remain very, very narrow. Um, so I, thank you, thank you very much again. Thank you so much for that commentary. It's really, it's very helpful. Let me just address some of the questions that were raised quickly. Yeah. This idea of domestic prosecutions, uh, in, in some ways, um, the United States is one of the leaders on this. And so there actually is a case, U.S. versus Countrymen, where a diplomatic security agent returning from abroad bringing a B-1 visa holder, so a domestic worker that he brought back from his posting abroad because his uh, actual residency was abroad. He was temporarily back in the United States and could bring a B-1 visa holder to, to be his domestic worker. In the Countrymen case, the U.S. government actually prosecuted him and his wife. Um, again, not for human trafficking, for a much lesser crime, the equivalent of visa fraud, but the United States has done some of these prosecutions. Um, as you mentioned, it is not, uh, it is not um, a crime that in a sense respects all nationalities, and so there's a case that was brought in the Eastern District of Virginia, Doe versus Howard, involving a U.S. diplomat and her Australian husband alleged to have held a domestic worker in their home for four months during which time she was brutally sexually abused and also held in forced labor. The Eastern District of Virginia case ended with a $3.3 million judgment against the American diplomats. 
The 2008 uh, TVPRA, oh, and just to back up for one second, the reason that that case was possible in the U.S. courts was because of two very important amendments to federal law, uh, one 18 U.S.C. 3272, one 3272, um, which covers human trafficking prosecutions and civil cases against all U.S. government employees. It's an extension of the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act. And then secondly, a standalone provision, 18 U.S.C. 1596, which provides extraterritorial jurisdiction for prosecution and civil litigation against people who engage in trafficking abroad, which covers all U.S. citizens, all legal permanent residents of the United States, and also anyone present in the United States. So it is in a sort of beautiful alien tort statute sense, a kind of tag jurisdiction uh, law that we, can, that we can use. The 2008 amendments to the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, that's a really important thing that you've hit upon because the ACLU, in coalition with a large number of anti-trafficking groups, and there's actually a working group on diplomatic crimes in Washington, D.C. That, that many of us participate in those 2008 amendments created very important baselines. So for example, contracts are required. Those contracts have to adhere to, as you said, US labor law. Most importantly, if there's credible evidence of toleration by a mission or an embassy of abuse, the law says that that mission shall be, the Secretary of State shall suspend from the A3G5 program. Uh, how many suspensions have we had? Zero, zero. Hugely problematic that Congress delivered a tool which has not been used. One footnote to this, and it's a footnote actually to the Cobra Gotti scandal. The Indian government seeking to now circumvent protections guaranteed by the 2008 Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act is now attempting, and I fear successfully, bringing domestic workers into the United States who would rightfully be A3 visa holders, but instead bringing them in as A2 visa holders. A2 covers administrative and technical staff of an embassy, which means, as a technical matter, their employer is now the state of India. And it's a contract negotiated, supposedly, in the state of India which means that they are out of reach for civil litigators seeking to protect and assert the rights of those particular domestic workers. It is a, a, a pretty egregious violation of a very beautiful edifice of protections that we have spent a decade building. The fact that the State Department is, I believe, allowing the, the Indian government to get A2 visas is highly problematic. Um, there's a lot of mischief going on here. So I'm happy to take maybe one question. I think I have just a second. Yes, please. Thank you so much for your interesting presentation. I have only a little bit of question. Uh, you have very well explained that in some of the cases, the problem is that it is impossible to execute the, uh, the judgment because uh, yeah. the, 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 the diplomat or the, the people in any case is, is abroad. I mean, it's impossible to do that. In, in other case, uh, the, uh, the victim uh, is not able to obtain any indemnization, a, any damage, uh, because of the, the, in the immunity applies. Uh, I, I don't know if in the US law uh, exists any provision regarding the, uh, the, is the, the subsidiary duty of a state to pay any compensation. I, I, I think so, but because in, in Spain we have adopted uh, three weeks ago uh, an act on immunity of, sta of, uh, of uh, foreign states and international organizations, etc., because we have had a lot of problems in, uh, similar to, to that. And uh, in, on the basis of the <coughs> recommendation of the uh, Conseil d'État, the, the Council of the State, that is the advisory body of the government in, in, in the country, and on the basis of the, advi the advice of the, uh, the judicial, the Council, Council for the Judicial Power, we have introduced uh, a provision, a little, little, little provision, but that allow in a certain, in a certain vein, the possibility to, to obtain some. Uh, uh, 
recognition mm -hmm. uh, in, with regard to the victims? I love that question. That's a fabulous question. I mean, the question really is, is the state where the crime occurred uh, secondarily liable for the damages that we win against the actual diplomat? It's such a great question. I, I recently, at, at one of these Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe meetings with protocol officers, I met with a Dutch lawyer. And the Dutch lawyer had been representing victims of trafficking in criminal cases, not against diplomats. The Dutch lawyer had retained, uh, had, had obtained criminal restitution for the victims in the case. And the Dutch government was given a certain amount of time to collect the money from the defendants. And were they unable to do so, then the Dutch treasury paid the restitution to the victim. And then the Dutch government pursued the defendant for the rest of his life. So that's the, that's the, kind, of, that's the kind of arrangement that happens in some European countries now. Now, when I came back to the Department of Justice and suggested a similar approach, I was told that was un-American. Not, not for quotation, but the, the, the idea that the federal treasury would cover these kinds of damages award doesn't really get a lot of traction here in the United States, which is unfortunate. Um, what we do, uh, we do obtain visas for all of these victims. So we can get special trafficking victims for all, uh, special trafficking visas for all of these victims to remain in the United States. And when they remain, they can stay in that temporary T visa status for four, for four years, and then they move to green card status and, and citizenship. The other piece of this is we are developing, slowly but surely, a network of international human rights lawyers across the globe who are enforcing these judgments. Uh, in the countries where the diplomats reside. And so we just actually worked with, um, with attorneys in another country where a defendant had fled um, and enforced a judgment in, in a third country. So it is possible, but we just have to be very aggressive. Yes, please. Uh, so Martin, great. Nice to see you again. Great presentation and sir, nice comments. So um, it will not surprise you, I'd like to, even though I'm out of government, I'd like to find a little bit of a State Department perspective on this. Uh, the, um, so one, of course, with the Copagati uh, incident, I mean, that was a disaster. I think Julian wrote a post on opinion of jurists at the time that said that the State Department deserves an F for handling of that. I think I wrote a similar piece of lawfare basically saying State Department deserves an F. I think the Justice Department also deserves an F. Um, and the problem, of course, is that set back diplomatic relations between the United States and India, you know, decades. I mean, it was terrible. Uh, I mean, you cannot imagine how awful this was for relations over this teeny, teeny case. Um, I guess one, one thing I really wondered about the Cobra Gatti case is, is you know, abuse of domestic workers by diplomats is, as you say, a serious, serious problem. It really troubled us at the State Department. But why that case? That was, that was not the most egregious of cases. I mean, I would have picked a case where someone was literally being physically abused, mm -hmm. um, where there would be no sympathy uh, for the, uh, so you know, we, we kind of handed a, a club for the Indians to beat us with. Um, second point on uh, domestic abuse, as I said, this is a, it's a huge problem for us at the State Department. There are so many foreign diplomats who do hire people and then abuse them. And of course, we have not only all the bilateral missions, but then we have the UN. So we have, uh, you probably count it, you know, hundreds of thousands of foreign diplomats in the United States. Um, uh, as you noted, the, my last year as legal advisor, President Bush did sign the 2008 uh, legislation, which was an effort to try to give the executive branch some tools to do something about this. I'm interested to hear you know, that they haven't been used. Mm -hmm. um, but here's the other side that you know that you know you didn't mention, and it's going to end up with my question: is you know immunity, and this is the whole theme of this conference. Immunity is not a favor that we give to other countries to be nice to them. Congress tends to think that, and then they get mad at the State Department about immunity. Like, you know, why are you giving immunity to all these foreign diplomats? It's all because you like to be nice to foreign countries. You know. That's not true. The reason we have immunity is to protect whom? Not foreign countries, it's to protect us. Mm -hmm. So if we start chipping away at immunity, then you know, American diplomats around the world are tremendously exposed. Uh, that's why we have the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. 
Um, and, and as we saw in the India case, of course, the Indians overreacted and did all sorts of things to us that they shouldn't have. And we could say, you know, that's inappropriate, but it just shows how exposed we, we really are. So um, you know, the problem then, if you're the legal advisor or the secretary, you know, you're, you've got to balance all these different interests. Um, and your first, your, you might not agree with this, but is, is if you're the secretary or the legal advisor, your, your first priority has got to be to protect your diplomats around the world. Um, you know, the, these issues are also important, but we cannot run a State Department if our diplomats do not have immunity around the world. So therefore, how do you balance these two you know, important equities? Um, and I was interested, and you know, I think you know, Harold and Susan, who were, you know, Susan's terrific, uh, you know, tried to walk this line in this brief to basically uh, uh, allow bad foreign diplomats who have abused their domestic workers to be held accountable in a very narrow set of circumstances, mm -hmm. but without opening up uh, uh, U.S. diplomats for unfounded charges around the world. Mm -hmm. So I'll sort of end with this question. Is you, you know, completely understandably, we're kind of giving the perspective from the advocacy community. Right. Right. You know, I would hear from the advocacy community on any number of issues, not just this one, mm -hmm. and I would say, I hear you, I agree with what you're trying to achieve. Please put yourself in my perspective where I've got to balance, right. you know, different things. Of course, the role of the advocacy community is not to be, and you know, it's basically to just push, 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 right. because if you start compromising with us, you know, you've already moved the bar over. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you now, put yourself in, you know, my former position. Mm -hmm. You know, my job is not just to hold accountable, right. you know, bad people like this. You know, my former job was to protect the immunity uh, of right. diplomats around the world. So, you know, how do you how do you balance those uh, those two equities? Well, so I do appreciate this perspective, and it's actually why the Swarna decision and the Swarna intervention is so excellent, right? Because again, there 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 is a class of advocates, there is a group of advocates, and and you occasionally read law school notes advocating elimination of diplomatic immunity. I've also heard high-level diplomats talk about the merging of consular and diplomatic immunity so that you know you would have only one Vienna Convention. I actually have no fundamental philosophical ob uh, objection to the way that diplomatic immunity operates now. I think we have found a way not to chip away at it, but to interpret the treaties in a way that is ethical and I think legally correct so that our efforts to hold bad actors accountable can still coincide with your efforts to protect U.S. diplomats. I, I completely understand that. I understand that perspective. But let me just throw a curveball at you because I think India was so badly behaved in this particular incident. And when the shoe was on the other foot, let's talk about this incident with the allegations against the Saudi diplomat who had allegedly committed rape against two Nepali domestic workers in his home. What happened? If you read closely, what you realized was the Indian police went into the diplomat's home and rescued the two Nepali women over the screams, objections, and horror of the diplomat's family also in the home at the time of the arrest, a home which under diplomatic law should have been inviolable. What the US did by arresting a consular official is nothing compared to what the Indians did by entering an inviolable home of a diplomat who was sitting, a representative of the Saudi government. And so, frankly, if Saudi Arabia behaved as India did, Saudi Arabia would currently be removing security barriers from the embassy of India in Saudi Arabia, you know, it, there there was so little. I think I think India is a is a poor example to base future policy upon because it is not an actor. I think dealing responsibly with these issues of immunity, particularly as this uh, as this invasion of inviolable space illustrates. With for me on that. Yeah. Thank you.
So we now have a break. We will reconvene slightly before 11. Uh, our next presentation will be in promptly at 11. So please, there's coffee outside uh, and continue the conversation in the halls. Thank you. <laughs>